Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Sorry for the late start. No, we were just understaffed with volunteers. Thanks, Byron, for being the only one. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's why we're running a little late tonight. Um, this is uh, actually a very special panel, as far as I'm concerned, um, because <coughs> women in the blockchain. Yay. And uh, I really am looking forward to the panel tonight. First of all, though, I wanted to introduce another woman. <laughs> Colleen McCulloch is actually hosting tonight's event, and uh, she's an IP attorney. Uh, so financial. 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 And she's going to just have a few words. Thank you, Pino. Um, so welcome, everyone, tonight. We're so glad that you could um, make it, and we really enjoy hosting um, the FinTech events here. Um, we've been doing it for a while now, collaborating um, with Pino, and um, you know she does such a wonderful job. Love to have you guys all here. Um, I'm a finance partner here, and I work in the structured finance and securitization area. So I'm very interested in fintech and all that you know that goes into building financial products and getting to capital markets. Um, but I love to dabble in the blockchain um, because I think it's impacting everyone, right? I mean, there's no question. Um, so. Without further ado, I will turn it over, but I, I'm super interested in this panel tonight, and I thank you all for turning out. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm going to pass it now over to Monette, who's the moderator, and she'll um, get all the ladies to introduce themselves. So if you want to share that one. Yeah, so thank you, everybody, for coming tonight, and thank you, everybody on the panel. Um, I'm very excited by the panel that Emma has, uh, has curated and put together. Um, I'm very excited about this as well because I've been in blockchain now for going on two years and my background is both technical and in banking. Um, I have uh, degrees in computer science and electrical engineering. I taught computer science for almost 10 years at UC Santa Barbara while I was helping other startups, um, four or five, actually five of which went public either through IPO or acquisition. And I co-founded an investment bank that did mergers and acquisitions and private equity placement. So the combination of all that seemed to bring me to blockchain. Um, you know, that in addition to uh, my computer architecture uh, professor was David Chom, who was the guy who invented DigiCash. And I've been working with a company called TokenSoft. I run corporate development. Um, and we're an end-to-end -end white label token issuance platform. I have some of my uh, colleagues here in the audience. So that's a little bit about me, and what I would like to do is maybe have everybody introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what you guys do. So, do you want to start? Thank you. Uh, so I'm Karen, and I've been working for BlockCypher for almost two and a half years now, uh, but I've been in the technology space for about 20 years, and I've seen a lot of ups and downs, um, and this one I say is, is very exciting and, and different. Um, and so I, um, to give you a little background on Block Cipher, uh, we're like Amazon Web Services for blockchains. And so over the last five years, we've helped over 20,000 different companies and developers develop new uh, blockchain applications. And they use our APIs and infrastructure to do so. So they can connect to uh, five different public blockchains and start up any permission blockchain. Um, using infrastructure. Uh, my name is Lily Liu. <clears throat> um, I'm currently unemployed. Um, uh, up until recently, I was one of the co-founders of Overt.com, which we sold to Coinbase earlier this year. Um, and uh, so prior to that, um, it was uh, Brand 21, which was an early mining company in the space. Um, I've been doing the blockchain thing uh, since the uh, end of 2013, 2014, when I was still in China, and then I continued when I moved back here. Um, prior to this, uh, Phil Hospital uh, working project via KKR and also uh, worked in consulting at McKinsey. My name is Vani Shri Rao. Um, I'm a cryptographer at Intertrust Technologies. We are uh, we uh, were the inventor of uh, digital rights management back in the day, and uh, now we have a wide uh, product portfolio around data security and data governance, and. Uh, uh, just to talk a little bit about, uh, 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 to give a sense about the kind of products we have or, and the kind of work that I'm doing for interest. Uh, one uh, project that I did recently was to enhance the security properties of uh, one of our products called uh, Whitecryption, which uh, basically provides a 
a protective layer uh, around any of our apps. So think about your banking apps or even your crypto wallets, uh, which de which deals with uh, extremely sensitive information like your private key. Uh, you lose your private key, you lose the money uh, in the blockchain world, right? Um, so it's a very clear value addition to have that protective layer. Uh, so it was a fun project to work in. And uh, we're also doing uh, we are also looking into blockchain technologies and seeing uh, uh, what we can solve with that. Uh, and uh, we are all already at a point where we have um, a security summit um, in Drone coming up uh, with Line, which is one of the biggest uh, mess messaging gap in Asia. So that's what I'm doing at Intertrust. And prior to this, I was a researcher at Xerox Park. And prior to that, I did my PhD in uh, theoretical uh, cryptography at UCLA. Thanks. Hi, my name is Audrey Chang. I'm an independent blockchain consultant and a crypto trader. And uh, right now I'm working on two big projects, one on the investment side, one on the tech side. So on the investment side, I'm helping Precursor Ventures, uh, which is an early stage traditional venture capital firm, um, start a token fund. And uh, more on the tech side, I'm the CTO of a new blockchain protocol called Infinium. Um, in terms of my background, I studied computer science at MIT. Unfortunately, graduated during the dot-com bust, so nobody wanted to touch technology, and um, so therefore I ended up on Wall Street for about a decade, um, you know, trading, investing, being a research analyst. Um, and then I left and got my MBA right during the other recession. <laughs> and, and I did used to work in structural products, which like caused the recession, but, but not, not what I worked on personally, thankfully. Um, but I did see that kind of coming down, so I was like, grad school, good idea. Um, and then after that, I, I founded two startups. So kind of like what Manit was saying, like all these things, uh, you know, the tech side, the finance side, the entrepreneurship, it all really like made sense that blockchain was something that I um, would be doing. And I actually did start in about 2013 and everyone made fun of me and thought it was like this monopoly money hobby thing <laughs> that I was doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow, what a group. <laughs> um, I... Um, Wow, my name is Jackie Hart, and I started um, teaching DOS. Does anyone remember DOS? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I started that, and then went into software training, and you know, just about everything in uh, databases, every software you can possibly imagine. Worked for Catapult and IBM subsidiary for a while. Then went into um, that was in the East Coast. And came here in 1996 into the Bay Area. Started into uh, Silicon Valley in project management. So I was one of those um, taskmasters with all of these tech companies, like Genentech and Oracle, and just you name it, everywhere I went. So I did that for about 15 years and loved it. Um, very high pressure job, but um, got out of corporate. It was too much, um, didn't care about the money, um, just needed my health. So left that and went into nonprofits here in the Bay Area, every nonprofit you can imagine. Um, and then I had a spiritual path as well. I'm a mother of five. So I had my yoga and my meditation very deeply. Um, very mystical journey I've been on. And Spirit said, you're going back in to financial tech. And I'm like, yeah, heck no. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. And so about a year and a half ago, I said, OK, I'll follow my guide. And did. And went to these blockchain conferences, got into blockchain, to love tech, um, understood it quite quickly and saw a real need right away for people to slow down. Like I'm an empath, and I saw things going very, very quickly. And then I saw the dark side, the shadow side. And we'll talk about that, well, hopefully. I hope we get real real. And I hope that we'll breathe together as well. Let's do that. Can we do that now? Do you mind if we all take a breath now? I feel like we could do that. Can we all take one short deep breath? OK. Let's just close our eyes for a second. One big deep breath in and out. I really needed that. I, I um, just drove here from Manchester, so it was about a four and a half hour drive, and my car broke down. And I just arrived. So thank you for that. Okay. Well, we've got quite a panel tonight. <laughs> Um, and thank you all for coming, and thank you for coming um, with your, you know, ex activities that you just had and, and your, your heartbreaking down. So, I'm sorry. 
Um, all right, so one of the things I wanted to ask the women on the panel is what attracted you to blockchain and crypto? And I feel like I should be calling it strictly ledger technology as things are really starting to evolve in this space and we're seeing a lot of different architectures that aren't necessarily um, chain-based. Um, and maybe you, you guys could also uh, point out some kind of highlight that you feel like your experience um, points to that has assisted you with uh, both your career as well as your journey in uh, blockchain. Uh, so, I first got interested in, the interest in the blockchain because of my experience at Informatica, and I spent, um, how many of you here have heard of Informatica? Okay, so just a few people. So just for the rest of you, Informatica moves data around. That's what it does. And um, the reason why it was um, so successful is because banks fundamentally don't share data, and they reinvent the wheel. And so every bank's like, well, I want to have my own database of all this data, and so I'm going to get all the connectors, all the ways to move data into it. And to me, that was just, uh, you know, while I made a lot of money for Informatica, it just seemed like a horrible waste of time. Um, in addition to having a lot of people just waste their time reconciling books and saying, literally, are you sure you put the comma in the right place for that account? Um, because it's not matching up over here on this ledger. So um, the blockchain made a lot of sense from that perspective. Uh, it eliminated, you know, the need for that kind of reconciliation to occur. Everybody had the copy. Everybody could see it. Um, and it also did away with um, a lot of the aspects of SWIFT. Um, how many of you have heard of SWIFT? Okay, yes, you know what's up. So I worked with SWIFT for a long time too, and while I was amazed and so amazed at how SWIFT is able to get things done, um, it was incredibly wasteful and incredibly expensive for many people. It just didn't make sense. Uh, so when I ran my first um, Bitcoin transaction, and it only took, you know, at that time, um, minutes, um, and only cost, you know, that time um, a lot less than what I would have spent on this transaction, you know, I was sold. Um, so uh, I got into um, uh, Bitcoin at the time, uh, playing poker and drinking beer. Um, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, one of my friends in Shanghai is telling me about it, um, a fellow named Bobby Lee, um, but known previously in Shanghai, and um, actually he sort of like grandfather for many people um, uh, with quite, quite some name recognition in this industry today, um, having sort of gotten them into the uh, into Bitcoin sort of 13, 14 time frame. Um, so that's how I got into it. Initially, I thought, you know, monopoly funny money that, uh, you know, what, what's the big deal about Bitcoin until I read the white paper. Um, and um, I was just really compelled by this intersection of um, technology, economics, this idea of, of self-sovereignty. Um, and uh, and that's you know part of the, the vision that really compels me today as well. Um, I think that we increasingly live um, our more and more a greater share of our lives in the digital world, um, and yet our tools um, uh, for interacting in that digital world um, have not sort of really caught up with that. Um, and with uh, with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, you can actually have enforceable scarcity, right? Um, you essentially have governance on a blockchain. Uh, and there are so many things about that which are really um, amazing to me, right? So as an example, um, you know, if you think about um, rule sets um, that govern behavior, I mean, that's really the job of government, right? Enforcing property rights and sort of setting a common uh, rule base for how we all sort of get along and what happens if we don't get along. Um, and that's essentially what we sort of have in these blockchain ecosystems. And to me, what's really interesting about it is um, these are, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of these rapid little experiments and actually governance, right? It's not just about money, it's really about politics as well. Um, and what's really neat about that is this is really the first time uh, that you can have really cheap, really bloodless um, experimentation with uh, with governance, right? And that's amazing. Last time we tried that, it took a century and cost tens of millions of lives, so it's called communism, right? Um, and this is, uh, this is uh, so that's one thing about it that is just really amazing to me uh, amongst many of the other things. Uh, so, my involvement, I've been interested in blockchain because uh, of my background in cryptography, uh, which is one of the uh, underpinning technologies of blockchain. And my involvement in uh, cryptography itself started when I was an undergrad kid back in India. 
my uh, math professor, he uh, told me about this very cool uh, crypto concept called uh, zero knowledge proofs. So um, uh, you may have heard about zero knowledge proofs already, but if you haven't, please look it up because uh, it is um, the enabler of privacy in the blockchain world. And uh, he also gifted me this uh, very nice book uh, called The Course on uh, Number Theory and Cryptography by Neil Koblitz. And, uh, and since then I got hooked on to cryptography and now I'm hooked on to blockchain. So that's my little story. We should definitely talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> um, so funny story, actually the reason I got into blockchain is because of a uh, co-founder, um, Balaji Srinivasan, who uh, you know, was a professor at Stanford. And in 2013, he taught this uh, MOOC, and it was called Startup Engineering. And at the time, I was working on a trading floor, but I was thinking about, you know, I really want to start a company. And it's been a little while since I've, you know, done programming, like, for real, so it would be good to have a little refresher. So, so I took this course, and I think there were something like 200,000 people in the course. It was like a lot of people, right? Um, and at, at the end, there was this um, leaderboard uh, where you put your project on, and you can move up by, by tweets and Bitcoin funding. And my friends and family were like, great, we want to support you. And what the heck is Bitcoin? And I'm like, don't worry, just tell me a dollar. It's like, I'll trade it for you and I'll put it on. Um, and they're like, okay, great. And then, you know, back then Coinbase did exist, but it took about like two weeks to get Bitcoin, right? And then the class was ending and I was like, you know, pretty high in the leaderboard. I went higher and people were giving me dollars. I'm like, oh, what do I do? So I started using local Bitcoins. And it was like very sketchy because I just go to a bank and deposit money into a stranger's account and just like hope I got Bitcoin. And I almost like met someone on the street corner. It's like a drug deal, you know. And I, and I backed out because I actually threw to my face. Yeah, I was like, I was like, well, I'm a woman by myself, and maybe it's not a good idea. So, um, but I finished number seventeen, and I had a full time trading job, so I'd like go home and code on Friday night, you know. <laughs> Um, so, but once I got into it, I'm like, hey, this stuff is volatile, right? And I'm a trader, so I'm just like, great, I can, let me trade the ball. And um, back then, no one knew what it was, so it's not like you're paying taxes. I since then paid taxes. <laughs> 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 you know, and, um, and compliance didn't, like, you know, I'd just be working on my trading job. And I'm just like, I'm going to take a five minute Bitcoin trading break. <laughs> um, and I was joking because that's when, like, you know, the BART had a strike, right? And I was like, oh, wow, a BART? They're getting paid like $200,000 to sit in the booth. I'm like, I should quit, go sit in the booth and trade Bitcoin all day. <laughs> I'm like, I'll help you at the bar. <laughs> so, um, so that's how I got started. <laughs> um, but I, I think like since then, you know, what's really exciting to me about it is, you know, I love technology. I love using it to improve lives, right? And so not only can we um, do things probably faster, cheaper, more transparently um, for just people like us right here, but I think a huge potential is you know, people in the developing world who, like, you know, tons of people don't have access to things like financial services. Um, and uh, blockchain has the potential to to get all these people kind of services they've never had before. Um, and the idea of self-sovereign identity, like, you know, with all this data about us everywhere, you know, Facebook hack, Equifax hack, with all this stuff, like, if we could actually manage that ourselves and choose who we share data with and for what purpose and for how long, like, that's pretty powerful. Um, so, yeah. And yeah. crypto kitty. <laughs> <laughs> and who else? Crypto kitty? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, my story with blockchain and, and getting into uh, cryptocurrency was actually at a Green Man camp. Um, started with Rob Pierce, um, a lot of the old OGs that started a lot of this are in my camp. And I would hear about it and you know, around the fire and just at dinner and and I would just question, what is this? And this was, you know, back probably six years ago. And um, and then I actually had some conversations, deeper conversations with them, and learned about what this really was and the value. Um, I'm also a humanitarian, and I also think about the unbanked and all of the different, many, many people in the world who actually can really benefit from this. Um, also, I'm, you know, think about value, and it's funny because someone had mentioned um, loyalty points. And I was married to a, a marketer for 17 years, and he was a loyalty brand snob. Like he would work in all of that, you know, loyalty programs. And so this reminded me of that. And um, so I thought, okay, this is a nice trade-off. And but I'm more interested, to be honest, in blockchain than I am in cryptocurrency. Um, I don't know what the future is for crypto, and I don't know what utilities, and I don't know what securities. Everything's moving so fast. 
blockchain I'm just much more interested in. Um, so I think that um, cryptocurrency can uh, completely ex uh, take um, exchange for fiat. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I'd like to talk about that. But I don't think it can, but I might be wrong. So um, I'm just watching, to be honest, and just observing. Um, I've only been in this space for about two years, so which is equivalent to more like like dog years, maybe 14 years, because it's going so fast. <laughs> so, um, but you guys are been around a lot longer than I have, and so I can't wait to hear your opinions about where you think cryptocurrency is going. Thank you. <clears throat> well, that's actually all interesting points that everyone's bringing up. And the thing that's so exciting for me um, in this space, particularly with when I meet other women in this space, is they're all everyone's coming from a different background. So I started off my career being a software engineer and working in low-level operating systems, internals, and real-time embedded systems, and working mostly with men. And then I uh, became an investment banker doing mergers and acquisitions and private equity placement. <laughs> Again, working mostly with men. Um, and one of the things that's been so lovely about being in crypto and in blockchain is that there's so many women that are engaged. And someone was just asking me the other day, and I'm like, why is, you know, are, are there just a lot of women in blockchain and crypto? And I'm like, well, if I go to the conferences, not really. But it seems like we've really developed a community. And so my next question was going to be about mentors and community and how you feel that that's helped you both with <laughs> Um, your careers up till now, and is it different or is it similar, or how's it you know working now in the you know in crypto and in blockchain? Uh, so I was lucky and kept in touch with one of my former managers who is the CEO of this company now, um, and I say she was a a big reason why I thought of joining um, the blockchain space, the crypto space, because I would say there aren't enough women, and when I go to conferences, it's it's like it was um, probably like you experienced, like it, it has been for years um, in the tech space where there just there just aren't that many women, um, and the the difference is you know working with uh, and, and that, that that can be totally fine, um, but I think in this space when you're dealing with money um, and like everyone said here new ways in which you're governing um, money and the, the the societies the communities that develop on these blockchains it's really important to get everyone involved. And I don't see enough of that. So that's why um, we started a group blockchain by women just focused on um, getting women to network, um, to hear about all different stages. So all of you, I encourage you to sign up for this group after this meeting. Um, our next <coughs> session um, is actually coming up soon and Lily will be um, a speaker there and we hope to have other women here on the panel speak in the future. Um, but I, I personally don't think there are enough mentors and there are enough women in the space. Um, so uh, uh, I feel like so the question is uh, mentorship and how, how you see mentorship in the space. Yeah, how mentorship has helped you both in your career up until now? And okay. is, is it different? Is it the same? <coughs> are you seeing it you know, more prevalent? Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I uh, probably best crypto conference I've been to thus far is Crypto Springs um, about two or three weeks ago. Um, and so I, don't know, I think some some of the folks here um, might have been at the conference or at least aware of it. Um, and, uh, you know, it was um, about 85% women. We love some guys in there as well. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, it was really, uh, it wasn't, you know, a woman in Washington conference, right? It was purely about substance, purely about content. It just so happened that 85% of the speakers there were women because guess what? They're all incredibly substantive, right? Um, and uh, I and also had like a fantastic vibe. It's very sort of, you know, it felt like a vacation, right? Because it was in Palm, uh, because it was in Palm Springs. Uh, and I thought that was a, like, uh, that was just a really wonderful community. Um, and uh, it's an opportunity for us to, to really, you know, meet and understand folks. And not just because, you know, uh, we're all women or something like that, um, but it's because everyone is doing incredibly substantive work. Um, and so that's been a really, uh, I think that's, you know, something I hope is repeated in the future. Um, and, uh, and you know, there aren't, um, uh, you know, there's a terrible number of people who have been in the industry for a long time um, and are in a position to be providing mentorship. I think that is um, starting. Um, and so, um, you know, if, uh, you know, I, people on this panel um, who have been doing this for a little bit longer, I hope that that's a responsibility that we all take. 
I, I, I do have been quite fortunate uh, throughout my career uh, by having uh, mentors at every stage of my career. Um, um, I, I, I talked about my math professor, so he was my probably my first mentor, and um, and uh, I believe that it's uh, uh, important to have a combination of uh, seeking out mentors and also um, letting a relationship uh, evolve into uh, mentorship. Um, and uh, I've had a little bit of uh, both uh, in my career. Uh, my uh, advisor uh, naturally, because it was a natural uh, mentor mentee relationship. Um, and then there are um, folks in the area, blockchain area, uh, for example, um, Professor uh, Dan Bonet, uh, he's a professor at uh, Stanford. Um, he's he's uh, extremely strong in the uh, cryptography world uh, and more so in the cryptocurrency world. Um, and uh, despite being one, one thing I find is that people are very helpful, um, despite being extremely busy. Whenever I had questions, he was kind enough to always make time to make uh, to give me guidance. And um, so this is outside of work, and uh, um, I believe that it also helped me uh, when I tried to have mentors within uh, my workplace. So in my previous workplace, there was a senior uh, vice president of computer science at the Xerox Park. She was extremely uh, forthcoming in helping women um, both navigate through uh, current situations and also helping them see what the next steps are. And um, and, and I also see that men are also forthcoming. Um, it's very uh, heartwarming to see that uh, uh, they, uh, um, they they um, help, they want to help uh, promote uh, women in the space. So. Uh, at, at my company, my uh, stakeholder map is the same as my mentorship map. Um, I, I report to uh, my CTO, my boss, uh, uh, and um, and there are people like... So, uh, at Interest, one good thing we have is that we have uh, extremely smart people uh, here to work with. One of the uh, people is a uh, Turing Award winner, uh, you know, said, right? Uh, so, he uh, his name is Professor Bob Tarjan. Um, so even if I get a chance to talk to him just for five minutes, it's a it's an extremely dense learning experience, and um, we have leaders, uh, uh, Bill Horn. Um, so we have extremely uh, helpful uh, people around. So I think it's uh, important to seek out and uh, uh, try to learn, and it's it's also important to be uh, to to. Uh, uh, you know, if, if you know there is a smart person, uh, go out and uh, discuss things. It's, it's okay to show vulnerability that you don't know something. Uh, so these are the things that have uh, kind of helped me uh, gain uh, mentorship by smart people. Yeah, so for anyone who's worked at a, a large organization, there's probably some official mentorship program. Um, and I feel like sometimes those like stick and sometimes those really don't. But I, I was fortunate enough to have some of those stick. And I thought it was really great just to have someone who's um, been around a little bit longer, has had more experience to just bounce ideas off of. And um, so I've tried to, you know, pay that forward with, um, you know, younger people, just, you know, blockchain or not. Um, I guess a specific example lately was a woman was doing her first um, panel moderation and she was like looking for feedback on the script and, you know, so I helped her work through that. Um, I think although there aren't that many women in blockchain, the women that are in it are are quite like just doing amazing work and very supportive of each other. So that's yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. 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 and it, and it's <laughs> awesome. And and um, I am now sad I didn't go to Crypto Springs because <laughs> I thought about going. Yeah, I was like, man, I'm just tired of traveling, and you know, it looks really great. But but then I saw everyone posting pictures and like saying how great it was, and I was like, okay, now I have FOMO kind of. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like, you know, events like that. Um, and I love when women are just talking about their work. You know, it's not really like, oh, it's a woman thing. It's like, here's the cool stuff I'm looking at, and here are the issues that are important, and like, whether men are part of it, like, it doesn't matter. It's just, we're just talking about really re relevant stuff um, in the space. So I find that really exciting. Um, and I think one thing that um, at least the women I know are very good at is trying to, you know, I know this whole space can be a little intimidating because, you know, as I think, 
John Oliver said blockchain is like all the stuff you don't understand about computers combined with all the stuff you don't understand about finance. <laughs> like, you know, it's kind of like there's so many levels of understanding what blockchain is, right? And I, I get that can be kind of intimidating, especially if you don't have a strong background in you know computer science or finance. Um, and I think people have been encouraging getting like you know new people to who are interested like to learn more. And you know, it's a it's a new space, right? So even if you know nothing, like we all start somewhere. Um, and so, yeah. yeah totally. uh, I'd love to just jump on that. Um, no one's an expert. <laughs> so it is so new. This is infancy. We're like toddlers with matches, I say, because <laughs> we don't know what we're doing. And so if someone says, oh, I know what we're doing, and, and, and I'm an expert, and, no, you're not. And no one is. So that's, let's just be honest about that. Um, so there's two things we're talking about, is mentorship and then also um, women in blockchain. So women in blockchain, it's funny, I got a lot of feelings about that. Um, it started with uh, Satoshi's female, and I love that, and I, I love you know, the founder, she's a friend of mine, Nyla, and you know, it was all like brave. But then, to be honest, I felt there was a lot of anger behind that too. Uh, I was around in the 90s in Silicon Valley when there was just like no women, hardly at all. And um, I was, you know, it was really hard, and you know, I was always not in the boardrooms, and always kind of put aside. And because I'm tough, I'm an Olympic swimmer. I was always like, Rrr. you know, I just put myself in there. Um, it still was was difficult. And now, um, I think for women in blockchain, we're growing. We're becoming more of a community. We're becoming more <coughs> empathic. We care about each other. There's a lot more groups and community, and we want to see each other succeed. And it's also the men. I think that there's a lot of men, awakened men, good men that are supporting us. So it's not like I'm mad at the men or it's like, you know, get out of the way. It's like, no, it's important. You're very important. And I think they're really helping us much more. Um, on the other side, I had a conversation with a woman in Norway, uh, an Indian woman, 35 years old, has been an engineer for 20 years. Almost 20 years, um, and she talked about how hard it is to be a, an engineer, to be a developer as a woman, as an Indian woman, and how it's very patriarchal the people who are designing these smart contracts. And are the song is what we're designing the men behind these, you know, this this um, tech. What is the motive? What is the intention? Is it all clean? Is it good? Is it pure? Is it good social impact? No, not a lot of it, and that's what she's seeing, and she doesn't feel like she has a voice. So she's very frustrated, and she's like almost calling me from Norway and Mount Shasta, and she like wants to quit. And I'm like, no, you have to use your voice. You have to stand up. So um, there's another side of that as well. It's, you know, women sometimes aren't heard. Um, mentorship. Uh, two mentors I can think of, my biggest mentors. Um, Peter Drucker. Does anyone know Peter Drucker? Yeah, <laughs> I was not, I was not a mentor. I was actually a fanatical uh, OCD fan. <laughs> I read everything of his, loved him. Finally met him. Um, he was enamored by my um, my <coughs> obsession with him. I think, and um, and then ended up mentoring me one on one, which was really beautiful, and taught me a lot about team building and how to build great teams, um, because that's what it comes down to is um, community and team, so I learned a lot from him on that and how to run a project on scope, you know, and, and on time and within budget, and but how to make everyone happy and how to have everyone work collaboratively, because that's what this is about, too. It's we have to mirror the tech. The tech is transparent, it's authentic, it's real, it's, it's blockchain, but are we as, you know, a humanity, are we actually mirroring that as well? So that's the consciousness side of tech that I like to talk about. Um, and then the other mentor is um, failure, uh, was my other, I failed a lot. Um, I did not get projects in on time and I was way over budget and teams were not on, you know, happy and people were fighting and people were quitting. And I remember those projects very much and I would have sleepless nights and so I learned a lot about those. So failure was a really big and important teacher for me as a mentor and I succeeded a lot. So. Um, it's, uh, my failures were, I tried to um, learn about how to fail successfully, how to fail um, with grace. Yeah, so. being able to learn from those experiences and then use them 
So the lesson is not lost yeah. <laughs> when you fail. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that you brought up, each one of you has brought up a good point. Um, early in my career, I had two mentors. My first job out of college, I worked with this woman who had come out of Bell Labs. And I was working, my whole career has pretty much been with startups or investment bank, which I started. So um, I was never part of a company that had a mentorship program or really much infrastructure at all. Um, but I was able to learn a lot from what she brought, which um, one of the things I credit with her to this day is she taught me how to write. Um, I would write specs. I would write design specs, functional specs, you know, any kind of spec. And she would take it, it would come back to me, and it would be mostly red. <laughs> and everything would be scratched out, and she taught me how to write in the most concise way um, possible while being complete. So being complete and being concise is such an important thing, um, particularly when you're writing um, in uh, technical journals and you know, technical documents. Um, but one of the early things also in my career was after one of my companies uh, went public, um, I started doing a lot of diligence for... Uh, VCs. And I'm curious, um, this is leading to the next question. Um, I would walk into a company to do diligence with the CTO and start asking <coughs> him or her, but mostly him, um, a lot of technical questions. And they would look at me and go, oh, wow, you're really technical for a marketing person. And I thought to myself, why are you assuming that I'm a marketing person? So I'm curious. <laughs> you, <were slide. laughs> um, you know, some of the types of experiences that you've had that have formed and shaped you. And um, I never was really angry about it. I was more amused. So, yeah, so I had similar experiences too. Um, everyone always thought I was in marketing or I was funny. Um, and then uh, yeah, and then and then it changed also when um, I started having kids. So. I, when I joined one company, um, I already had one kid, so nobody could, nobody could tell, right? I had a kid. And then um, I was pregnant, and you can't hide that one. So um, so when I came back, they're like, and I, I was in a management class, um, one of my peers said, why are you here? Didn't you just have a baby? And I turned around and said, didn't you just have a baby too? And he looked at me like, uh, what, is, what does that have to do with anything? And then, and then later on, um, we, when I... Uh, joined a company to become, you know, VP, and I had to fly around a lot. Um, the same question came back, and this was actually from my mentor, who said, you know, Karen, are you sure that you can fly this much? Because who's going to watch your kids? And I turned around the question, and I said, well, who watches your kids? And at that point, he realized, you know, what, what he was saying, and he was like, okay, yeah, good point. Sorry about that. Um, I know you're fully capable. So I think um, with all these situations, what I found was the best tool was to use humor um, and to try to put them in my shoes uh, because there are a lot of times when I couldn't. So when I could, I would use that advantage because, yeah, I mean, working in tech companies and with sales, you get everything. Um, and every woman I knew had dozens of stories um, to talk about. And, uh, and so you just have to... Take the tools and, uh, and yeah, get people on your side because they're there. Um, just have to, have to do them one person at a time. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> so I also have two kids, um, two years, nine months, and also four months. Um, and I was just uh, reflecting on a conversation I have almost every day these days, which is maybe with people uh, tell them I have four month old. And I get that question every day, who's taking care of your children? Say, not me. <laughs> Obviously, because I'm talking to you right now, right? Um, and it's not, it's not poorly intentioned, uh, but I wonder, you know, uh, well, that's a really interesting question, because as I understand, you also have one, two, three children, and, um, and no one's asking you that. Um, and so, uh, so, you know, I try, um, in many contexts, actually just not to talk about it, right, unless it's explicitly asked. And then also, um, the last, uh, I would say, month and a half that I was pregnant this time around, um, I mean, look, like you're all kind of a go-getter. You're like, yeah, I can go to that incremental meeting. Yes, I'm going to go do it. Um, but then I think um, I didn't really realize that, you know, after sort of being in this process for nine months, you're basically like a frog, which is being boiled, right? 
by the time, you know, every um, every indignity that you uh, undergo in pregnancy, and there are many of them, they're incremental, they're small, they happen every day, right? So by the time you get to month eight or nine, you think you're doing fine, right? Because you're just a little bit worse than yesterday. Um, but in comparison to, you know, where you are typically, um, uh, uh, yeah, I just, I had to keep that in mind. I'm like, you know, it's, it's okay. Everything, is, well, it seems like everything in blockchain is moving a while second, but actually it's a lot of perpetual motion. Um, and it's a lot of sort of loud voices on Twitter and so on and so forth. Um, a lot of mouths, not that many hands right now. Um, and it's all right, chill out, watch TV, right? Enjoy yourself. Um, and uh, and that's fine because you might actually be doing yourself a disservice by like, you know, sort of, um, waddling into a meeting with someone you've met for the first time when um, you're just not feeling great. Uh, so when I was doing my PhD, uh, most of the uh, most of my peers were um, men, at least the one, at least in the conference that I went to, uh, there were mostly men, and uh, uh, more than negative. Uh, so I I I didn't uh, come across particularly uh, negative uh, experiences. But still, I did notice that we, we are a minority and that already has a say in the way you feel. Uh, the positive uh, part of it is that, uh, uh, again, going back to what we were just discussing, right, uh, the importance of uh, having strong mentors who can have your back. Um, my uh, advisor at the time, my advisor, uh, Prof Professor Amit Sahai, he really helped me uh, um, when I went low on confidence and he challenged me uh, once to say, you know, um, there, there was one year when I didn't have many publications and uh, he challenged me to have a single author publication and uh, um, and I, I hadn't seen him for, a, for about four months or so and um, I ended up having a single author paper and uh, um, it was this, um, uh, it, it was this question that I solved uh, um, uh, in, in um, key exchange uh, in cryptography, but uh, anyway, so um, uh, so so I think uh, going back to uh, having mentors, right? So th there there is also uh, this positive side. Uh, I have only uh, fortunate uh, that I have uh, seen uh, more positive sides, um, um, and and having uh, a support system. Um, uh, through mentors and uh, uh, with, within family and friend, friend circles will help us uh, continue to uh, be active uh, despite having, uh, you know, we make families and uh, I, I also have a four month old, by the way. Um, so yeah, that's all right. Um, and then one other thing I would add to that I've been thinking about this a lot recently is um, after you have um, incubated a child for nine months, right? And then, you know, breastfeeding however long you choose to do that. Um, what I find to be really interesting is that um, women seem to like take on a lot of guilt around motherhood, right? Oh, I'm not doing this properly, am I breastfeeding long enough or not enough? I mean, that's a whole other topic because if you read the literature, it actually makes very little difference over formula, but that's a whole other topic. I don't understand why people are so into breastfeeding. Um, but uh, because honestly, it's like based on science, which actually is not um, it, it's not tried and true. Um, that's a whole other topic. Uh, but what I find is that a lot of women um, feel like the onus is on them. But look, like you just donated a year of your life to like to create a human being, right? The last thing you should ever feel um, is uh, guilt or of any sort. Because um, as far as I'm concerned, after you've done that, like. I mean, I look at this human being and I'm like, wow, I, I, I made you, right? Um, and uh, and that should really be, like, not just respected, but really honored. I actually want to add one more point to in relation to what you just said, which is, um, I did a panel for a panel, uh, uh, 10 days, uh, 9 days after I gave birth, and, uh, um, and it was fun, and uh, my husband took care of my kid um, for two whole days, because I also... <laughs> wanted to go through the questions and so he I didn't even have to request him he just knew that that was the right thing to do so having that uh, there there are uh, patriarchal um, you know the male dominated uh, parts and has its own repercussions but also uh, now I think we are getting much better and uh, having that support system uh, I, I, I think is uh, is amazing in this uh, time. 
Cool. Well, I don't have any kids yet, but I'm excited that if that should ever happen, I have a lot of great role models here. And I'll remember not to be guilty because, yeah, that's a long time to be, to be incubating. Um, but I, I guess some like funny stories related to what Minute was first saying. Uh, so last week was us of blockchain week. So um, I went to talk to a guy at his booth for a while, and he was talking in very like simple baby terms. And I'm just like there for a bit and asking technical questions. After a bit, he's like, wow, you know a lot. Like, who do you work for? What's your LinkedIn? I'm like, yeah, I do know a lot. <laughs> but um, I was like, well, you know what? Maybe, you know, he just talks to everybody like that because it's a large conference. It's a learning conference. Like, not everyone is technical here. So, okay, maybe I shouldn't, like, take offense or anything. But then later that day, I was, like, sitting, just working on my computer. And this random guy comes over and just, like, goes to these two nerdy guys, like, sitting right next to me. He's like, hey, are you guys engineers? And starts like pitching his like project or whatever. <laughs> and uh, I'm simultaneously glad that I don't have to deal with that, but also <laughs> kind of like, oh, that thought never even entered his mind space, but potentially maybe, like I could be an engineer too, right? And I'm just like, well, that sucks because people have such this idea of like what an engineer looks like. And that I was like, okay, well, I'm kind of annoyed. <laughs> but, but you know what? It's not like a huge part of my time that I spend like kind of being annoyed. Um, and last year I went to uh, DevCon, which is like the big Ethereum developers conference, and it is mostly men, but I gotta say, like, most people I met were, like, really cool and awesome, and I had great conversations with them. Only one time did a, did a guy say, like, hey, you know, we're hiring all sorts of people, even head of marketing. I'm like, yeah, I'm at a developer yeah. conference. <laughs> but, you know, like, you know, usually it's fine, and I think most people in the, in the space are, are very, just like, you know, great people. So, mm. <laughs> <laughs> nice to differ. <laughs> Um, we need more women engineers, so thank you for feedback. Are you as well an engineer? I know you are. Yeah. Just like, uh, yes, well, I was. Um, okay. Once, okay. Sort of, yeah. um, <laughs> we're growing more of them, which is great. My daughter, who I have five, so big age span, but my one who's turning 13, very bright and very much loves math, but she just can't get enough of math, and she's in seventh grade in uh, I think right now um, testing at tenth grade for math. So I think about her and I think about you know kind of nudging her gently to blockchain and to learning you know what we're going to need in the future more women more softness more empathic um, engineers that are going to um, create you know good in the world that, with their coding you know where there is a patriarchal type of coding sometimes you know behind that. So thank you for that. Um, so I do believe um, we need more women. What was the question? Um, I, I don't even know. It was about, we've mentored, but can we go back? Because it's been, I've been so enthralled with all. <laughs> I lost, but when it gets to me, I forget. <laughs> I know, was, it's, it's. Okay, about, we should start it. Yeah, the stigma? It was about stigma, women in, in, in corporate and stigma? Was no, 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 no. It was more the experiences that you've had. Both as a woman pre blockchain oh, yeah, post yeah. and with mentors. So. Oh, okay. Um, so remember when tech companies were really cool with the with the pool tables and you know like the Friday wear jeans and you know remember that in the nineties? Remember like how you know? So everyone bring their dogs. You know like it was a really cool thing to bring your dog. I didn't have a dog, so I brought in my kids. So um, yeah, and and like I was just like I'm bringing my kids. I don't have a dog get used to it, you know? So I'd bring in my nine-month-old, and she would sit next to me, and she would do what nine-month-olds do, and I'd be running my projects, and um, that's how I run, I, I run my teams. Like, this is real, real. Let's, can we please be real? So um, other people wanted to bring in their kids. I'm like, okay, so Friday is kids' day. So let's do that. So it was like dogs are out, kids are in. So um, <laughs> it was great. Um, and so... I don't think, here's what it is, I don't think I really had a problem as a woman because I'm kind of a tomboy. I kind of, I kind of mend, I kind of, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I get along with men really well. I think they're really cool. And so I'm able to um, sort of um, shapeshift to whatever they need me to be. Um, so I wasn't, you know, I don't know what a, what a woman's supposed to act like, but I was a woman and I was accepted. Where it really got to be a trouble was um, when I would try to get higher up with the sea levels. I'd be in, you know, sea level meetings and I would be very accepted, but there was this feeling of, oh, you know, what do you have to say? What's, um, what do you have to, to bring to the table? And it, I felt, um, that's where I felt 
or I was a woman in those those bigger meetings. But my projects with everyone else, it was all the same for me personally. Um, oh no no no! I have another I have another really cool one for you. Um, when I was pregnant, and I, I guess I had five, <coughs> I was about eight months pregnant and very uncomfortable, and I my water started breaking during uh, I did during, I think it was like the Friday. And um, everyone was very concerned for me, my team's very concerned. And so I went to the hospital, I didn't have the baby, came back on Monday, and my entire team had um, pillows, like all the men, put in like large pillows into their, into their uh, outfits to just be able to say, we get you, Jackie. Like, we know what it's like to be pregnant. And so the whole entire day, they were pregnant for me. So I had 15 engineers all with, it was really funny. It was really cute. It was really sweet. I remember, I have a picture. There you go. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I also have three kids. I have three boys, and tonight they all have Satoshi's female uh, T-shirts. And tonight, when I put this on, my ten-year-old said to me, "He goes, Mom. He goes, you know, they don't really know if Satoshi is female or male. He goes, so so you could be lying." <laughs> and so I said, "Yeah, that's true, but it's more of a statement. It's uh, you know, and I've always felt that um, as a woman, we need to embrace you know who we are and." Uh, I've been very inclusive with my kids, and I'm really fortunate to work with a group of people where when I come in on the weekends, my kids are there, and everybody's been really accepting of my kids um, who are aged 8, 10, and 12. And <clears throat> I remember with uh, my first one, I was a managing director at an investment bank, and I was about nine months pregnant, and I was going out and pitching deals with my partner, who was also a female, um, who wasn't pregnant at the time, by the way, and people looking at me like, who's going to, you know, support us if you have a baby next week? And I'd be like, well, my brain's not going down, and <laughs> I have an entire group of people that we work with, including other partners, so, you know, don't worry, we're going to be fine. And um, I remember some of my early meetings after my first one was born, uh, sitting at home with the Moses basket right next to my desk and <laughs> breastfeeding during um, calls. So, and no one seemed, you know, really all that worried about it. So, but it's really changed, yeah. hasn't it? That was like the old days. I mean, I really think that right now <clears throat> things are so different for women. Um, so much more accepted. I mean, do you feel that out there? That with women? Yes. No. <laughs> you know, you know, okay. Okay. Well, my mother tells me yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We've got a story from the audience. Let's, uh, do you want the mic? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. So um, um, I have two kids and uh, I run a tech company, a software company out of DC. And uh, I started a company after my son was born. And then uh, two years later, my wife gets pregnant. And, uh, you know, I'm flying all over the world. And uh, it's a tough pregnancy. Uh, when she was pregnant with the boy, it was amazing. You know, we had a blast, we traveled, everything went well. The, the delivery was a little stressful, but you know everything was beautiful. But the second pregnancy was a girl, and it was, it was brutal. She was sick every week, and I was on the road. I couldn't, you know, I didn't know what was happening. So one day she's fighting me about uh, traveling too much. I'm like, yo, I'm building a company. And uh, she looks at me and she says, I'm building a human being. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that's the only time she's ever knelt. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that, um, that story. Um, so we have time for one more question. And I think um, everybody's brought up some really interesting things tonight. Um, and at the beginning, I think one of the topics that came up was social impact and the environment two issues that are so important right now. Uh, and so I'd like to get your thoughts on, on how you think that that's, um, how that's going to be impacted by blockchain. And just a little story, and I'll, I'll pass this on. Um, between each of my companies and projects, back before I had kids, I would often take you know anywhere from six weeks to three to four months, actually six months at one point, traveling in third world countries. And I used to be a big climber, I'm still a diver. And I used to spend time in the Himalaya before people actually went there with cell phones. And, you know, being in these really remote regions, and I remember thinking at the time, 
What are the, I mean, so just so you know, I wrote the TCP IP stack for Ericsson's like class of routers. So, I mean, that's kind of how early I was in networking. And also, uh, tells you how old I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I used to sit there and, and watch people in these villages and think to myself, how is technology going to be impacting them? And like, how long is it going to be? before technology really starts to impact these people on a daily basis. And these would be in these really remote uh, regions. So on that note, um, yeah, sure. so um, in terms of social impact, I mean, I think a lot of us believe that, um, in the space believe that the people who benefit the most from the blockchain, from cryptocurrencies, will be people who aren't privileged, who aren't in the U.S. Um, and are in other places. And so um, I've seen a lot of our customers take that to different countries in the world. Um, remittances was one of the first, and still is, one of the biggest use cases um, for cryptocurrencies. People who want to send payments back home um, don't want to send it via you know, Western Union or something else that takes all their money uh, or takes most of the money, you know, can do that through remittances. And so um, still see that as a very big use case and something that is going to uh, only grow. The other area in terms of the environment is energy um, and um, promoting the use of distributed energy resources. So we just got finished uh, doing a project with uh, the National Renewable Energy Labs where we're promoting, um, and, you know, we did a project to show that it's possible for people to send energy payments peer to peer. So let's say that you have a um, solar panel and I have high energy needs um, because we're in San Francisco Bay Area. Also, I have a you know a Tesla or an EV vehicle, right? I don't, but um, <laughs> let's say I do. Um, and uh, but I have other high energy needs. I have, um, and so I need to be able to pay for um, electricity. Or you know, in other cases, actually, this has happened um, when it's a natural disaster. We get natural disasters all the time now. Um, unfortunately, um, hurricanes and things like that that bring down power. So how do we enable people who are able to produce power with solar panels, um, give energy to those who don't, um, but also get compensated for it? So um, in this use case, we showed that you could use the blockchain to do two things, not only enable two, two homes, two peers, um, to send each other payment, but also to send um, the, the receipt that energy had been received. So only when I receive energy from you, according to my contract, would I be able to pay, uh, pay you for that energy. And this can be used for not only pure <coughs> um, energy payments, but EV charging, so that as you travel and use your um, electrical vehicle around the country, around the world, let's say, um, you're able to go and pay for that energy from somebody else, um, at a charging station that's owned by somebody else, uh, but using the blockchain for it. And um, it's something that I think the utilities are um, starting to get and uh, hopefully will implement sooner. Um, <clears throat> uh, so um, I've, I've also spent quite a bit of time in the uh, developing world. Um, uh, in my 20s, all I really cared about was traveling and um, I oriented basically every job I had around the opportunity to spend as much time away from my home office as possible. Um, and really it was just uh, born out of curiosity of um, how you know different countries and uh, different cultures uh, live and uh, just what the, what that on the, uh, on the ground experience is. Um, for me, I think about it less as kind of social impact. Um, I think if you think about the internet as providing access to information, you can do with that as you will, right? Um, here's uh, here's a pipe, you know. Here's uh, information, and then you can you know you can use email productivity, consume various types of content. That's really your choice, what you want to do with it. Um, but I think that that, that that blockchain provides that access to um, it provides economic access, right? Instead of just data access, economic access. Um, and I think that's uh, that's really powerful because um, I think that um, uh, really it's about um, you know empowering individuals to you know do what they will with those opportunities. Um, and so, uh, and you know, most people uh, in the world don't necessarily live um, in a very high-functioning uh, society, country, government, where money works, rule of law works, and those sorts of things. And if you're not so lucky, um, then uh, this is um, this is uh, something that that uh, individuals can access, and I think that's really powerful. 
so two parts to your question, like one is the uh, environmental part and the other one is the economic. Uh, yeah, and unfortunately, part. I think we're no, no, out no, of time. Please Are finish. We okay? Yeah. okay, we're good. Okay, I'll try to break. Uh, so the environmental part, I, I don't think that uh, blockchain will have uh, a significant effect on uh, environment going forward because uh, blockchain, yes, of course, has been having a huge impact because of uh, a huge amount of energy getting spent per block uh, be, uh, getting entered into the blockchain. But however, so many more, uh, so many different uh, blockchain technologies are um, being uh, invented, which do not have uh, this downside of having to spend so much energy to get what we want, the uh, distributed ledger consensus. Uh, so I think blockchain had a first mover advantage. So I think it has had its mileage and maybe a little bit more, but I think the test of uh, return on uh, investment is uh, going to choose something else. And uh, regarding the economic part, uh, I do also believe that remittance is uh, one of the very uh, uh, clear value addition of uh, blockchain. Um, and there are just so many applications and only time will tell what uh, will stand the test of time. Great, I will try to make it short too. Um, but uh, I guess, you know, as much as we like to complain about our banking system here, our, our, our currency is relatively stable, things generally work, right? This is not necessarily the case if you live in like Venezuela, for instance. So there's a lot more opportunity there. And similar to um, how a lot of technologies kind of leapfrogged in developing nations, like people didn't have landlines, but they have cell phones, right? So, um, you know, maybe blockchain will enable all sorts of stuff that was never able to happen before. Um, a couple uh, instances already, you know, in use right now, uh, the UN has um, some projects with refugee camps, where um, one part is just you know kind of transferring money. A lot of money does get lost to corruption and, and stuff like that. So now, if you're using blockchain, it's a lot more transparent. Um, but also, even directly working with refugees, they have um, this iris scanning system where uh, you could just show up to the grocery store and um, you know get your allotment of groceries. You don't need ID or anything. They just scan your iris, and like that's pretty cool. Um, another thing is, you know, people have already men mentioned remittances a lot. There's a, an app um, in the Philippines where, you know, a lot of people leave the country to work and send money back to their families. So not only can you do that, but um, they've integrated with the current kind of financial system so that you don't actually need to have a bank account, but you can still access services. So for instance, um, if someone was sending you money on this app, even without uh, being a customer of a bank, you can get a one-time use ATM code, go to that bank and put, punch it in and get your money that way. Or you could go to like the local mom and pop store and kind of do the same thing. You could pay for your cell phone, you can pay for you know school tuition, all sorts of interesting stuff. Um, so there's stuff happening already, which is uh, you know starting to make a difference. Yeah. Um, thank you. So I'll just spin off um, a different way of looking at this. Um, all of the above and on all of you, I mean social um, blockchain for social impact is, is sort of like a buzzword. We're, we're hearing a lot about that blockchain for good. For me, I kind of look at it as um, what is, well, DLT, digital ledger technology, has been around for a long time, right? So now what, what do we have? What's, 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 what's the big thing right now? And for me, um, I look at it as more as a social impact, like a renaissance that we're going through. It's, um, this space is, um, it's interesting to me because um, I do see the light side of it, and I see the dark, and we didn't get to really talk about that tonight, and that's okay. But, um, I do see the light side, and I see collaboration. I see a lot of us um, being more authentic, more transparent, more open. A real community is beginning. Brock Pierce says, we're not building new businesses. We're building communities, and that's true. That's really what this is about for me. So what's the blockchain for good? Is that we're building a closer uh, knit community. Humans are becoming um, you know, more um, collaborative and not com competitive. So I can go on about that, but that's the only thing I want to touch on. Besides what you're so I'd like to thank all the panelists, and I'd really like to give you a big round of applause.